Okay, I'm back to do the uh, aquatic biomes. Um, this slideshow will probably be a little bit faster than the last one. Um, it'll probably be a lot faster. Um, so uh, thank you, Oliver, Chloe, Aiden. Uh, you might see at the bottom there, uh, just dropped out of school. That was me writing that, Aiden. Um, Christian, uh, Kason, thanks for doing this. Um, except for Aiden, who's a dead man, thank you. Um, so uh, freshwater is a really tough biome to describe because there's freshwaters all over the planet. Um, you know, most of these uh, just show the highest concentrations of freshwater, but technically there's freshwater essentially everywhere on earth. Um, freshwater covers the world's map. And I'd like you to think of this as the world's circulatory system. The same way that I have veins and arteries, the world has its freshwaters. Um, it's also important to point out that there's almost no fresh water by volume. If you take all the water on the planet, fresh water, like surface fresh water, is 0.04% of the Earth's total water. It's almost all salt water. Then the next biggest chunk is uh, groundwater. The next biggest chunk is frozen water. There's almost nothing in fresh water, you know, rivers, lakes, and streams. It's a teeny percentage, um, a debatably small percentage of the world's uh, total water. Um, the only thing that I'd like to add to these slides, the kids did a really good job. It's a huge biome. They really covered it. Um, Aiden's a dead man. Um, the only thing that I'd like to add is that all pollution becomes water pollution because rain falls through the air air pollution becomes water pollution. And anything you leave on the ground will be washed away by water. So fresh waters is where you aggregate all pollution. It either just rains through the atmosphere pollution or across ground pollution. And so fresh waters are our circulatory system, but they're also the delivery method for all things that we soil on the earth. Um, wetlands are super important. This will come up a ton in our class. You guys did really well with this one too. Thank you, Tanner. Thank you, Valeria. I really like the little arrows. Um, thank you, Claire. Um, thank you, Luke, um, Estrella, and Carissa. Um, uh, wetlands are places that are sometimes wet and sometimes land. So swamps, bogs, floodplains, marshes, um, a place that is sometimes dry and then during the rainy season it'll fill up and then during the dry season it'll dry out. Um, that's a really good place to go farming. So um, the wetlands of Santa Barbara is where um, early Mexicans used to um, grow their corn. Uh, that's called milpa agriculture. Milpa means a corn plant, and that's why the street is called Milpas, and that's why the lights underneath the overpass are corn. Um, wetlands were historically very important to agriculture. The chumash used to grow in our local wetlands before the Mexicans were here. Um, and actually concurrently with Mexicans too. Um, it's important to point out that all wetlands are seasonal because of that rhythm of when it's wet and when it's dry. Um, it's important to consider that these are usually shallow waters and in the wet season, a bunch of material is delivered. So these are nutrient rich, shallow waters. So you've got a whole bunch of organic material that settles with sunlight. And so these tend to be hyper productive and all of that biological activity filters and improves water. It's important to point out that wetlands provide the most ecological service per unit of area, meaning that wetlands do the most free work for you per square foot. 
they absorb water, they recharge groundwater, they prevent flooding, they filter water, um, they uh, feed migratory species, they uh, produce a lot of small biomass that's edible for seafood, they give an environment where fish can breed, so they support fisheries. Wetlands are really important to us. Um, I should add that there's a special type of wetland, which is the side of a river. So when a river is really full of water, it'll flood the sides and that provides all those nutrients and all that moisture as the water recedes, that's good farmland too. So historically people have um, farmed floodplains like the fertile crescent is between two rivers and that's why they farm there. That's why it's fertile because the two river floodplains. Um, you know, these areas get super developed. Fertile soils, they're flat, they're near water. So if it's not farms, it's cities. Wetlands are probably the most important natural area and they're almost gone globally. They're just too useful for other things. We've already used them up before we realize how important they are. Uh, California, for example, has single digit percentages of its remaining wetlands now. And uh, federal government, when they wanna give you money to improve environments, uh, it's always about restoring wetlands because they're so helpful to humanity. Um, uh, estuaries are where fresh water meets salt. Uh, people call that a river mouth. Um, because this happens at sea level, the water deposits sediment and then meanders. So you get this pattern, it's called a delta. And you have to know that like the Greek letter delta, which is a triangle. Uh, river mouths are often called river deltas. That's the same thing. And that means an estuary. It's that triangle shape that a river gets when it slows down at sea level. Um, these are really critical estuaries. You can imagine, uh, really critical wetlands, I mean. Uh, thank you, Chris, Pico, uh, Daisy, Ava, and Mara for making our slides. They're really good. Um, because the river mouth is the largest floodplain, these are huge wetlands. They're a special type of wetland. But because they're at the coast, they're also fresh water and salt water, high tide, low tide, right? So high tide salt water comes in, low tide fresh water goes out. So they're wetland, floodplain, but they're also an example of vocab. An ecotone is the place where two biomes overlap, like it's river part of the time, but at high tide, it's ocean, and at low tide, it's river, and it, so there's an overlap. That's called an ecotone, where two biomes overlap. And what that means is that area has saltwater diversity and freshwater diversity. It has double diversity. That's called the edge effect. This is vocab. You'll need this later. Ecotone and edge effect. Estuaries are a perfect example. <laughs> I'm almost done. Thanks for bearing with me. This is a long slideshow. I'm losing my voice. Um, remember that all biomes have an edge. So all biomes where they overlap with whatever is the neighboring biome will have an ecotone. So you can have the ecotone between savanna and rainforest, or the ecotone between desert and savanna. And those all demonstrate the edge effect. You can have savanna species and desert species in the same area. It's not like biomes have like a fence where you like switch from one to the other. They tend to kind of blend in. And so you get a mixing of species for greater diversity edge effect. That's true of all biomes. But estuaries are a good example. All right, I'm almost done. Um, coral reefs are like the tropical rainforest of the ocean in some ways. It's the tropics, so there's not a lot of seasonality, which means the conditions are constant. Um, there's a lot of light. And so with a lot of stable 
productivity and stable conditions, you get a lot of diversification. You've probably seen like in Eli's pictures and in William's picture and in Jack's picture and in somebody didn't do their thing. Um, how much diversity is in coral reefs? It's like every nature documentary, right? Um, that diversity is like the rainforest, stability and productivity. Um, one important difference though, is that hot water holds least nutrients. You might remember this from upwellings. Hot water has very few nutrients. So most of the stuff in coral reefs grows really slowly. There's little tiny fish that are 100 years old. There's corals that have been there for 10,000 years and they're not very big. As a matter of fact, almost everything that grows is growing stone, calcium carbonate, hard shells. And so coral reefs, you notice I said carbonate, that's a big sink for carbon. Carbon from the atmosphere goes into water and then that carbonate gets made into hard shells. Underneath all that colorful stuff is a bunch of stony shell um, underneath all of that too. So coral reefs are a critical sink for carbon. Um, and it's important to point out that all of those specialists are really suffering climate change. This is another one of the places where climate change really shows up. Um, for one thing, because the ocean temperature is changing, but much more importantly, because all the CO2 we added to the atmosphere is making a lot of carbonic acid in water. And so we've been worried about the CO2 climate issue, but a much bigger issue is the CO2 acidifying the ocean, which affects a lot of the base of the food webs in coral reefs. Um, something else for your notes is that they are um, really harmed by temperature changes, but much more so by ocean acidification. Calcium carbonate can't form in acidic water. Um, I hope you roll that down. There's a lot of details there. You could go back and get all those details. So a uh, temperate coastline is where you're from. Somebody didn't finish this one, but thank you, Lila, for this one. Thank you, Jalen, for this one. Uh, thank you, Chloe and Ivy for this one. Um, wow, that's really, I like these. These are nice. I don't know, this looks nice because we live here, temperate, right? Our part of the planet. Um, you can see on the map, that's pretty close to where we are. Um, this is cold water and cold water is highly productive because cold water holds more dissolved nutrients. <clears throat> what I want you to know is these are the most productive ocean zones on the planet. They're near the coast, so it's relatively shallow, sunlight hits, you get really cold nutrient rich water, and by the way, you get inputs from land so these are the most productive ocean waters on Earth. As a matter of fact, the Santa Barbara Channel is debatably the single most productive chunk of ocean for year-round productivity anywhere on the planet. You see, the tropics is productive because all the sunlight and rainfall, but in the water, cold is better. So temperate coastline is the most productive. Uh, fun fact. Kelp is the fastest growing thing. In ideal conditions, kelp can grow two feet per day. There is nothing that grows faster than kelp. So if you're in an environment that grows good kelp, you're about as good as life can get in terms of fixing biomass, growing stuff, super productive. Arctic coastline is stark. I feel bad for Sam who did a beautiful job and I really like your map. Or for Dane who again found a killer map. Um, or for Soren, um, another good map. I really appreciate you guys doing this. This is a stark, difficult biome uh, to talk about, but it's really important in environmental science. Um, for one thing, it's like the tundra. It shuts down dark and cold for half the year. 
And then the other half of the year, it's nonstop sunlight in very cold water, which means it's super productive. So productive that you get these clouds of algae bloom followed by these clouds of plankton eating all the algae and then whales and bait fish come to eat all that stuff from all over the world's oceans. There's excellent fishing here because when all the life migrates in the summer season, that's where everything goes. The Arctic coastline is where the sardines go, it's where the whales go, it's where the salmon go. And so the entire world's oceans depend on this one big surge of nutrition during the good part of the year. And of course, migration, there's a whole bunch of life that will run across the planet to find another place to eat. In some cases, all the way from the North Pole to the South Pole. Now, uh, this is also the area to watch in your future when we talk about climate change. In the next 20 years, keep your ears open for news about the Arctic coastline. Um, warming here is especially destructive. Changes in chemistry because you're adding more fresh water. Um, changes in salinity because you're adding more fresh water affects currents. The CO2 that's everywhere in the air means that the ocean is acidifying everywhere. So a lot of little tiny delicate stuff at the base of the food chain here is not responding well to the ocean acidifying. And remember, like I said earlier, that the Arctic regions are gaining the majority of our new heat. The whole planet is warming, but most of that warmth is in the Arctic. Um, so this might be a visually boring uh, biome, and I can understand why it was difficult to do research on this, but ecologically, this is kind of where all the action is. Uh, this is where rubber meets the road for climate change. Um, okay, we're almost done. Uh, the open ocean is the biggest biome overall, and so I can't imagine what the kids had to do to find information. You can see that uh, Ian and uh, Catherine and McKenna and Ryan uh, and Mary may all have found very different climographs and stuff because there's no single climate for the largest biome. The open ocean is huge. They did great with the slides. There's a lot of info here. Don't neglect to look it over. Um, the ocean, the College Board sometimes asks about the layers. So like pelagic and benthic and bathic or whatever. You probably want to look at the layers of the open ocean. I can't remember the word, sorry. Um, but I want to add a couple things. Um, almost all nutrient cycling happens at the top quarter inch. It's called the micro layer. That's where all the atmosphere gases dissolve into the entire ocean. And that's where all the ocean's uh, dissolved gases go back to the atmosphere in the micro layer. That's a technical term. It's about a quarter inch. And that's where all the gas exchange happens. That's also where almost all productivity happens in the open ocean. So it's a food pyramid upside down. Instead of producers being at the bottom, Technically, in the physical sense, in the open ocean, the base of the food chain is floating on top. And the little bugs come to eat that, and the little fish come to eat those, and the bigger fish come to eat those, and the predators come from the dark. And so there's this interesting pattern. I should probably point out that this is the world's largest source of oxygen, and it is the largest exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So seasons in the ocean drive our planet's total oxygen and CO2 patterns because most photosynthesis happens in the water. Most of the intake of CO2 and output of oxygen happens in the ocean. And because there's different amounts of ocean in the North and South Hemisphere, one summer is different in CO2 terms from the other summer. So I'll explain this more later. I should also point out 
that the ocean has mysterious and complex circulation when you factor in the depth. Honestly, this is so hard to study that this is one of the edges of science. Like we're learning a lot, but there's a lot that we're still trying to figure out about the rates and patterns of circulation. And as climate is changing the composition and temperature of that water, it's moving differently now. So right as science was starting to map deep circulation in the ocean, we're starting to lose track of that data because it's changing underneath our feet. It's really fascinating. Um, I need to mention that the ocean is humanity's number one source of protein. We get more protein from this than all land sources combined. And that's really important to remember because we're protecting humanity's food sources when we protect the ocean. Um, you and I, we probably just eat out of the ocean for a good time. But globally, uh, that is the number one source of protein for humans overall. Um, I should point out that these food webs have a lot of layers. It's not like cricket, mouse, snake, hawk. In this case, it's like one plankton, a different plankton, a baby fish, a different baby fish, a tiny fish, a small fish, a medium fish, a bigger medium fish, a predatory larger fish, larger predators, more predators. And so it's a very stratified and complex food chain. Um, the big changes are the ocean's getting hotter because water absorbs most of the heat of the earth. You understand that water has a higher specific heat capacity. Maybe you learned that somewhere. Um, I should also point out that the ocean's pH is changing. That's called acidification. Um, and finally, I should clarify that sea level rises not so much because new water but because hotter water is bigger, like a thermometer climbs as it gets hotter, you know, that red line of alcohol is expanding inside the glass. Likewise, the ocean is trapped by continents. And as that water gets hotter, most of sea level rise is not from new water. It's from bigger water. Finally, thanks everybody for doing these assignments. Finally, General notes, ecotone and edge effect, stability, productivity, diversity. Remember that the degree of seasonality is a really big deal when we describe biomes. Um, remember migration is interesting. Remember places that have more or less diversity and explain why. And uh, I'm sorry that this went so long. I've lost my voice, it's almost midnight. This was more than an hour, so I'll have to break this up to upload it. Wish me luck. I'm going to try to get this on the internet now.